So I, I would like to welcome you all here this evening. Um, I am uh, Jim Huff. I'm the Chief Executive for the Scottish University's Physics Alliance. And it's a very special year for physics in Scotland this year, not just with the International Year of Light, but with the 150th anniversary of um, you know, Maxwell's uh, papers on electromagnetism, and also, of course, the 100th anniversary of Einstein's general relativity. And, I mean, probably relativity wouldn't have come about without the work of Maxwell. And I think everywhere around the world, the importance of James Clark Maxwell is increasing year on year. Now, before we uh, introduce the speaker, though, can we all please switch off our mobile phones? Because uh, this lecture will be recorded, and there'll be an audio version of it. And then a written version will also appear in a few weeks' time. And we're very lucky tonight to have, have a very eminent speaker in Prof Professor Malcolm Longair. Now, many, is, many of us have known Malcolm for a long time. He was born in Dundee. He went to university in Dundee when Dundee University wasn't in existence, and it was a college as part of St Andrews. And he got his degree in electronics and physics from there. After that, he had a very distinguished career, and still has, in fact, but he became... Um, after being, uh, doing his PhD at Cambridge, he became Astronomer Royal for Scotland and he was director of the, the, of the observatory here, um, the ROE. And then he went back to Cambridge and he became head of school, or head of department at the Cavendish, became a fellow of the Royal Society of London and has continued pursuing his interests in high energy astrophysics. But one of his main interests has been James Clark Maxwell, and so we're very lucky to have him here tonight to talk to us. Malcolm. Thank you, Jim. Well, thank you very much, Jim. It's always an enormous pleasure to come back uh, to, to Edinburgh, which I seem to come about once a month nowadays for various reasons. Um, I think, as uh, Jim mentioned, I'm passionate about, about many things, but my greatest passion, I think probably, in science is Maxwell. It is an utterly incredible achievement. And I want to demonstrate this evening just some of that. I had hoped to fill the whole of the lecture theatre with apparatus and do live experiments, uh, but they said, oh, well, maybe not on that wee table. So here we are. Anyway, we're celebrating, uh, again, the launch of the International Year of Light and the 150th anniversary of Maxwell's great paper. And uh, we'll have a look at that at the end. So here's what I'm going to do this evening. Uh, light and colour from Snell to Young, then Maxwell and colour, Maxwell and the quantitative theory of colour, and then light as electromagnetic radiation. So that's what we've got to get in through. It's going to be at the non-technical level, except at the end. But that's for my colleagues, just to show that I'm respectable. <laughs> Now, the whole story starts with, uh, with Snell's Law, uh, which was discovered uh, by Willy Broad, Van Snell, and Royen. The law for the refraction of light, the way that light rays bend when they move from one medium to another. And I hope everyone will forgive me putting in the second slide the sign, but everybody knows what a sign is, so we'll, we'll, so we'll leave it there. This is uh, Snell's very, very famous law, which tells you how light bends. Now, remarkably, this was applied very soon to atmospheric uh, phenomena. This is Descartes' theory of the rainbow. This uh, was applied the idea that if you've got spherical raindrops, then, of course, the light will bend inside the raindrops. And he realized that in that top picture there, there's a minimum angle of deflection of 42 degrees when there's one internal reflection inside the raindrop. If you allow two reflections inside the raindrop, you get a minimum angle of 51 degrees. That's pretty good going for that time. Here is the picture from uh, Descartes' Le Meteor from 1637, showing Descartes, our friend, looking and getting exactly the right angles for the rainbow, the primary rainbow, and the secondary rainbow in, at this very, very early stage. But what Descartes didn't have uh, was the understanding of colour. Well, as I tell all my students, uh, 
At the age of 22, Newton discovered the binomial theorem, integral and differential calculus, theory of color and optics, and the unification of celestial mechanics and gravity, which is not bad for a 22-year-old. So I tell all my students, get, get going if you're going to be uh, operating at that sort of level. <clears throat> now, what he, uh, uh, Newton's uh, great contribution <laughs> in optics was in his experimentum crucis. This is the first uh, one, which demonstrated the way that light is decomposed into different colors. Here is the sketch uh, that Newton himself drew of putting light through two prisms, just ordinary sunlight coming through a hole in the wall, and then you put it through a first prism and then through a second prism. So this is just showing schematically uh, what he did. White light comes in, is then refracted through the prism, then you select only the red light, and then you see if it splits up again. And he found it didn't. And this is where his famous statement came, light itself is a heterogeneous mixture of differently refrangible rays. Well, uh, of course, you never believe anything unless you can do your experiment itself. So I knocked together with ancient bits of apparatus in the laboratory, except these prisms were bloody expensive because you've got to get very, very good prisms to make it really work beautifully. Anyway, uh, what you see that we've got here, we've got a light source, one prism, then a slit to select various bit of lights, and then a second prism. So uh, since, I, since I couldn't actually... Uh, bring the kit with me, I, I made a video of it working. Now, if we could have the lights absolutely down to, because there's one bit which I had trouble with. But anyway, let's see what happens. You see me doing the experiment. There's the original spectrum splitting up the white light in different colors. And now what I do is I now move in the second prism and already you see the answer. There it is blocking out the bit of it. You're not getting any new colors at all. It's simply reproducing the same colors. And now I put a very, very thin slit, and I hope you can see that what we eventually get, if you look very close, there it is. There's the, there's the red. Can everybody see the red? No more splitting up. So Newton got it right, as you would expect. But that is the experimentum crucis and told us the way that light is composed. So what you can then do is to then put white light uh, through prisms, putting in the correct refractive index for the different colors, and you've got this beautiful uh, picture here. What you see is that there is this minimum angle, but the red light gets deflected less than the other lights, and therefore you get this uh, beautiful uh, colors of the rainbow. Inside the rainbow itself, you've got a mixture of all colors, and therefore ends up being white again, which of course is what you observe. So, yeah, let me, let me show you my own rainbow with a very large raindrop. And you can see my large raindrop is just a spherical flask here. And what I've got is, again, my light source behind this with power of light hitting my large raindrop. And then you see that. Right? There's the rainbow being produced at the right angle with all the extra illumination inside because of the mixture of the rays. You can do this, do this in, the, in your own home. Have fun. Make, make, make rainbows. So uh, that was the, the idea there is that there's this minimum light. It's like a, it's like a cusp, uh, in the, uh, to put it technically, of what's happening. So that's where the theory uh, of the rainbow comes from. Now, you can do other wonderful things with this. Uh, putting light through hexagons is actually rather fun. And what I've done here, I've got three of these rather good quality uh, uh, prisms again. And you can see it's just half of a prism. And so what I did was to shine a laser beam through that. And what you want to, I want you to notice, I'm going to rotate the little table there, and you'll see what happens when I do that. So if I now just let it run, here we go. Now you'll see my hands appear, and I rotate it only in one direction. It comes to maximum angle. I keep rotating. It goes back again, right? There's another minimum angle when you go through a hexagon like this. But now the minimum angle of deflection is 22 degrees. Now, this is how you explain halos and sun dogs about the sun. What well, turns out, if you look at what happens in the atmosphere, there are plates and columns, these hexagons, at certain heights in the atmosphere. And for various reasons, they can all get aligned up. And when that happens, you get things like that. Now, I don't know how many people have seen things, these phenomena, these halos and sun dogs. Have people seen them? 
They're quite rare at the latitude of Edinburgh. This, this, you normally don't, you've got plenty of cold, but you've, got, you've really got to go to the far north where you've got these very cold conditions, very clear atmosphere, very conditions. But this main circle here is at an angle of 22 degrees about the sun. There are other interesting things happened, and if you're really interested in this subject, I suggest you try to explain that one. <laughs> It's an absolute whopper. Uh, but this is what happens up at very high, uh, very high latitudes. You can see these sun dogs and everything. Absolutely fabulous. It's a great subject. Now, one other just little footnote. Uh, one often wonders why does one take, suppose that there were seven colors in the spectrum. Well, the real reason for that is indicated here. That in, according to the just harmonic scale, uh, there are only seven, seven independent to notes in the scale. And you can see I've got them here uh, indicated fa, mi, la, so, fa, la, so, okay, so. Just the seven notes, independent notes in the harmonic scale. And because of the ideas that there was celestial harmony, Newton had to find seven colors. That's where indigo came from. The, the people have terrible trouble finding. Anyway, that's where that one comes from. But again, that's a, again part of a, another story. Now, the next hero is Thomas Young. Now, his brilliant research were going to put the wave theory of light on a firm physical basis. Now, it is said that his concept of interference of waves was the result of observing ripples on the pond in the paddock in Emmanuel College. He was a member of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and here is the pond in the paddock with waves. How about that? This is the idea that you would get reinforcement or you would get uh, the opposite of that occurring at different angles. So this is the idea. This would be the concept of the interference of waves. And this was the double slit experiment, the famous experiment he did, whereby you have light which illuminates two, uh, two holes, small holes, and then you can observe these patterns on the screen. And then here is his wave theory. Here is again the waves coming out, two separate holes, in the, in the, the coherent uh, waves, and you get maxima and minning by the constructive or the destructive interface of the waves. And that was absolutely convincing evidence for the wave theory of light. But the question was, but what sort of waves are they? The answer wasn't going to come for quite a bit later. Now, uh, Young's diffraction experiments are great fun. Again, I would have done this if I had all my experiments here, but I lashed together just some things, and lasers are wonderful for doing this. Uh, what we've got here is a, is a very simple apparatus. We've got this a set of various... Um, the shapes we're going to fire the laser at and just see what happens. We're going to take that little roll there and just see what's, what, what happens. So if we look at the first one and we've got a single slit, then we get uh, this pattern with these minima, which are because, you, you, because of the finite width of the slit that we've got there. But then if we move along to the next one, then we start getting all of these interference patterns occurring. All these spots uh, which are reflecting the fact you've got now many, many different uh, waves interfering. But if you look back at that one, you can see we've got the same over configuration for the narrow slits, but then superimposed by superimposing the various slits there. If you make the slits fatter, you get a different picture. Again, you see there the various spots on the screen, again, are somewhat more clump because of the width of the slit. And you can affirm, here's this one, this itch shape here, where you can actually see again the different shapes of the patterns in the two directions. And then finally, just a simple example, what are these little things? These, there are these little holes in the plate. When you do the same experiment, here's what happens, right? Beautiful images. And this tells you immediately, ah, they weren't holes, they were little diamonds. That's where, the, that's where the shape comes from for that. And so you can see what goes on. Now, this is very important from the point of view of, of, of contemporary science because diffraction and interference in physics is absolutely everywhere. And if you are clever enough or lucky enough or have got ingenious enough, you can actually invert the diffraction patterns to work out what was going on. And basically, that's what's going on in optical and radio interferometry, X-ray diffraction, and the way in which the DNA model was discovered, all came from inverting the diffraction patterns of the things that were being looked at. The trouble about these images is they don't have the face information, and that's where you've got to be really, really clever. 
to find out ways of putting the phases into the waves. But that has been done, and that's uh, one of the great stories of modern science. Now, in the same paper in 1801, Young also produced his theory of colors. And he was concerned about how you could possibly distinguish all the different colors that you see in the spectrum with the eye. In his picture, the light receptors on the retina of the eye are going to be excited by the incoming waves, but he realized there was a big problem with that picture. And here's what he writes. As it is almost impossible to conceive each sensitive point of the retina to contain an infinite number of particles, each capable of vibrating in perfect unison with every possible undulation, it becomes necessary to suppose the number limited. For instance, to the three principal colors, red, yellow, and blue, and that each of the particles is capable of being put into motion more or less forcibly by undulations differing less or more from perfect unison. Each sensitive filament of the nerve may consist of three portions, one for each principal color. And this was the first concept that the three color vision was how we actually observe colors. Now notice, Young took the three principal colors to be red, yellow, and blue. There was no distinction made between the mixing of light and the mixing of pigments, one of which is addition and the other is subtraction of light. And the theory was qualitative rather than quantitative. Now, this is where James Clark Maxwell uh, comes in at last. I'm sorry to hold him back so long, but he's worth waiting for. Now, at home, uh, James and his uh, father, John Maxwell, they, John was really interested in all the new scientific toys that were being produced at that time. Uh, and also, his cousin, Jemima Wedderburn, who was eight years older than, uh, than, than James, uh, they had great fun playing and inventing uh, these toys. In the 1830s, they, were, they used the concept of the persistence of vision by which the eye can respond more rapidly than about a twentieth of a second to, able, to be able to see the next image. And that's how cinematograph cinematographic film works. Uh, just f essentially, we see it as being continuous. So uh, the first example they had is the thaumatrope, uh, where you've got the opposite sides of the car. I'm sure when I was a little boy, you used, used to have these, and you pulled them like this, and they went round and round and round and round and round, and you got the superposition of the front and the back. So there's the... The, the dog on one side, the, 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 the grouse on the other side, and there's a rather weak joke around the edge of it, which says, why is a pointer dog like a highwayman? Uh, because he's in quest of prey. <laughs> anyway, the, point is, the point is that this was one of the, one of the toys that they, they were playing with. Now, the, the next one to come along was in 1832, the phenakistoscope which was the way in which you would look through the slats uh, in a mirror at these various pictures, and then you would see the appearance of motion. I've actually just done a simple PowerPoint animation of the one on the left. So uh, here's the phenakistoscope from 1832, and there it is. Rather nice. You see there, 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 the lady and the gentleman dancing rather nicely, and you just keep on going like, 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 like that. The next thing was the zoetrope, which was invented in 1834 uh, by William Horner, originally called the Daedalum, Wheel of the Devil. And now you viewed the images through the vertical slats in the rotating drums. You can make your own zoetrope. I found this on the web in 1905. This was a supplement of the New York Sunday American and Journal <coughs> newspaper. And you can make it up yourself, and then put these strips on the inside, and then you will see uh, th 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 things like this. For example, if we put this on here, there it is. You see, oh, that's rather, rather sweet. You build, you build, build, build your own zoetrope. So go onto the web, find it, and have fun. Now, of course, typical Maxwell, uh, in 1861, he actually improved the zoetrope by putting convic the concave lenses instead of slips. And then the result of that was that the image was then formed on the vertical axis of the spindle, rather than just by looking at the far side uh, side of the drum. 
uh, and also enabled more people to be able to see uh, what, 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 what was going on. And so uh, Jemima and James, they made lots and lots of strips. And I've got a collection of around about 50 strips that they made. James would sketch it out, and then Jemima, being a brilliant artist, made them into the real uh, pictures that you actually see. Uh, of course, the typical uh, academic, once he'd done this, he set this as a Cambridge Tripus problem in 1869 when he was external examiner for Cambridge University. We all do that too. So anyway, here's one example of one of Maxwell's strips, strips which is of, of, of great scientific interest. He realized that you could actually make scientific use of these types of uh, moving images. And this is a case of three interacting vortices. Now, in the mid-19th century, one of the favorite theories for atoms was that they were frictionless vortices in the ether. And what, did them, what Maxwell and Thomson demonstrated is that these were stable structures. They would just keep going on forever. There was no dissipation mechanism if they were frictionless. And so this is Maxwell's model of a triatomic molecule. It's a stable structure in which they are going through each other, and you can see going around by each other. Beautiful model. Now, I'll tell you one thing which is even cleverer. That this picture, it takes 24 frames to get all the way around that cycle. And yet, there are only eight pictures. Look that one up. It's brilliant. Absolutely. But typical, typical, typical of Maxwell. <coughs> now, uh, going back to his early stage, uh, Maxwell uh, got a fellowship at Trinity. He'd, he'd gone to Cambridge to try to make him more respectable as a, uh, as a mathematician and scientist. His, his thoughts were all over the place. But while he was there, he, he demonstrated his brilliance, and he won a fellowship at Trinity College to continue his studies on the composition. And one of the things he did was to work on the composition of light. And here you see him with his color top, which he used to understand quantitatively the way in which colors add together. So here's a nice picture of how it works. We've got the three different colors. Uh, notice now that he's using the proper primary colors rather than the pigments, which are red, green, and blue. And then you've got a nut in the middle, and you can put various amounts of the different colors, and then just spin the top, and then they will all get mixed up, and you match that then to what you see on the middle. And that way, you can get quantitatively what the combinations make the different lights that you see in spectrum. So, uh, uh, we've been through all of this. The nice thing about this is he could also change the brightness because he could also put in a black and white one, uh, white, white segments as well. But here's just an example of one of these experiments. That dot, that black dot there, shows you this mostly blue, little bit of green, and a tiny little bit of red, uh, depending upon how far you are away from the corners, corners of the color triangle. Now, at the same time, it also suggested a cause of color, color blindness. If you didn't have one of the colors present, then you would not see things. We'll come back to that just in a moment. So there's Maxwell's original version, drawn by hand, uh, with the different colors, uh, get, and just drawn like this. And this is the modern version, rotated through, uh, through 120 degrees. And you can see uh, he, he did a jolly good job for what was possible at the time. Now, he carried on doing these experiments. Uh, he, he moved uh, to, uh, to Aberdeen, uh, where he did a great deal of preliminary work on his great papers of later years, and at the same time uh, married Catherine Mary Dior, uh, who was the daughter of the principal of Marshall College. That didn't prevent him getting made redundant, and he went, had to go off to King's College London to carry on, on his work. Um, I, I love these pictures. We've got this one in the Cavendish. Uh, I'm, I'm having it restored just now, clean it all up uh, for the Maxwell, for the Maxwell centenary. And this is, again, a photograph of them as, as well. I, I love this. What I particularly love is to look at Maxwell and look at his dog. Now, you, you, you know these stories about people looking like aliens. <laughs> I'm never quite sure which is which, but this is the same. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a lovely picture. And uh, when uh, the, the proposal to put, build the statue uh, of, uh, of Max, a wonderful thing done by Sandy Stoddart, Stoddart um, the one thing which I contribute to that story, I insisted that Toby the dog should be there. <laughs> and, and Toby, 
uh, they did appear, you can see Toby there. They, the, the doctor always called Toby. And, and Toby also went around the lab every day with Maxwell just to see how the students were getting on. It's a wonderful stuff. Anyway, when you look at Toby, thank me for getting it on Sunday's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful statue. Now, he still wasn't uh, completely satisfied uh, with the experiments. They weren't accurate enough. And so he built his light box. Now, we've heard about another light box uh, earlier this evening. This is Maxwell's light box, which is an extremely ingenious uh, device indeed. This bo box was built by Smith and Ramage of Aberdeen. So here it is. Now, there's a replica of it in the James Clark Maxwell Foundation, which we built in the Cavendish for the foundation. And do go and have a look at it. It's a wonderful piece of apparatus. Uh, the simplest understand what happens by running it backwards, first of all. If you put white light in through the, through, through, through the, uh, the output uh, lens, then it goes through the prisms, and that splits up the light. And then you've got a sort of a graticule which can separate out the lights. So that's how the light will, uh, will, would come if you run it backwards. Now run it forwards, and you will see the bending of the light will put the red one, as give you the amount of the red one from the lowest one, green from the middle one, and blue from the top. And so this is what's happening now. The white light from the sun comes in, but then to come be joined together at the point A, you only get red from one, green from the other, and blue from the other. And so you can then vary the amounts of the colours by just varying the width of the slits that you allow uh, the light to come in. And here it is. This is the, these are the slits here where you can see this is, uh, this is allowing so much of the blue, green and red light through. And you can then make very accurate estimates of the colour equations needed to make any colour. And this was published in a very major publication by Maxwell in 1860. Uh, on theory of the compound colours and relations of the colour in the spectrum. So uh, this was the forerunner of the modern chromaticity diagrams which define how different colours are going to be synthesised. And they convey information about the variables of colour vision, spectral colour, intensity of illumination and the degree of saturation. So these are examples of the modern version of these diagrams, 1931 and uh, uh, 1976. But you can see it was all done by Maxwell. It was all there in the original Maxwell papers. Now, there are, how, uh, well, just before we get on to one final point, Maxwell also took the first coloured photograph. And what he did now was to put a set of filters in front of this coloured uh, tartan ribbon here, so that he only had plates which would only let through red, green, and blue ultraviolet filters. And then he had these, these made, and then passed the light, projected it onto the screen, and you were able to reproduce the colors here. And you can see, it really is amazing. This is the first time when I had got this tricolor uh, uh, representation of the colors on this tartan, tartan ribbon. Now, everybody needs luck in science. Luck is absolutely mandatory. And in this case, Maxwell was jolly lucky because his emulsions had essentially zero response in the red filter. He shouldn't have seen anything in the red. But it turned out that there was an ultraviolet leak in the red filter, which transmitted light in this wave band. And then the red dye in the ribbon reflected the UV light, so the UV light reproduced on the red negative. That's what you call luck. That it was true to work, but in fact, it did very successfully. So uh, Peter Reed has read, redone these at uh, the University of Edinburgh. It's a, really, uh, a lovely piece of work. So uh, Maxwell's uh, colour legacy uh, in, in this case is here. We now understand that there are rods and cones at the back of the, of the retina. The rods are very sensitive and can register the arrival of individual photons, but have no colour discrimination. And the cones are less sensitive, but are sensitive light centred on the red, green and blue wavelengths. And so uh, that explains uh, some phenomena. Here's normal tri trichromicity at the bottom, normal human vision, old world monkeys and apes, all our friends. Right? They've always got the normal uh, tricolor vision. But then there are cases where in dichromicity, this is in non-primate mammals and in 2% of human males, only males, they don't have the red sensitivity. 
And again, there's an in-between case where anomalous trichromacy is about 6% of human males. So it means that it's fairly likely that somebody in this room is colorblind, is, is only, can only see that top one there. I shan't ask for a show of hands. <laughs> Now, what we actually see, of course, is, is, is a result of many other things uh, beside that. The, the, rough, the smoothness of the surface, is it rough, is it highly reflective, polarizing, and so forth. And uh, for, furthermore, the blue cones are sparsely distributed on the retina. And what it means is it's very easy to fool the eye. Color-wise, uh, because of these the, these phenomena. Let me just give you one of my favorite examples about how to fool the eye. Right now, here you see a you would agree that's a yellow sheet of paper, a square sheet of paper. Right, and what I'm going to do is to bring in a wiggly line, which will stop right down the interface. All right. Now I'm going to make that begin to go away further and further, and see what happens. Now, I think many of you may have seen the yellow seeping into the white bits and the white seeping into the yellow, right? I'll do it again. Just watch what happens. Does everybody agree? No. <laughs> you're too close. You, your eyes are too good. But if you're further back, you would see that what the eye interpret, the, there is not sufficient resolution in the eye to be able to distinguish things. And so the brain interprets it as being a yellow area when in fact it is actually actually white. Now, now we get to the link with electromagnetism. Uh, Maxwell was working on a huge range of disciplines, essentially the whole of physics as we, as, as we now know it all the time. But uh, the work for which uh, one of his great pieces of work is the understanding of electromagnetism. When he started working on this work in the mid-1850s, here's what he wrote. Before I began the study of electricity, I resolved to read no mathematics on the subject till I first read through Faraday's experimental researches on electricity. In other words, he was driven by the details of Faraday's great experiments. Now, Maxwell worked by analogy. And in fact, he one of his great early lectures is called Analogies in Nature. So he would look for similarities between one bit of science and another bit of science. And in this case, the analogy was between magnetic lines of force about a magnet and the flow of fluids. In both cases, you've got lines which determine what the strength of the flow is, the speed of flow, and so forth. So he built his model on that analogy. And by 1856, uh, he had got to this uh, primitive and incomplete set of equations for the electromagnetic fields, which had been established, which had been worked on for the previous 50 years, in terms of the electric field, the magnetic flux density, the magnetic field strength, and the current density. Now, don't worry about the mathematics. That's just to show you what he did. And it's incomplete, so far as we know today. But what's interesting for Maxwell, what really worried him, he didn't have a mechanical model for what was going on. His thought was Maxwellian, and he was thinking about in mechanical terms for how you could make these equations give them physical meaning. In 1845, Faraday had shown that the plane of polarized light is rotated when it travels along the direction of a magnetic field. And Kelvin and Maxwell both inferred, therefore, that magnetism was essentially a rotational in nature. So what Maxwell did was to fill up the whole space with rotating vortices, which are going to represent the magnetic field. Now, this is a purely mechanical model uh, for the, what was going on in electricity and magnetism. So there is one field line there, and this could be modeled by a rotating vortex. So you just fill up the whole of space with these, and you get your magnetic field lines and these rotating vortices. That's the basic model. But there's a problem. You can see that there will be friction between the rotating vortices up there, and that might uh, cause them to actually disrupt. And so he adopted the engineering solution of putting ball bearings or idle wheels between them. Right. Very good. Splendid engineering. Absolutely. Make sure you can keep all of the vortices rotating in the same direction, and that would then give you an equivalent of a constant magnetic field. 
And this is a picture from his great paper, which appeared in the Philosophical Magazine in 1861. And again, he's represented these, uh, these vortices by hexagons, which are rotating, and the little idle wheels and the ball bearings by the, you see the little balls along there. Now, the remarkable thing is that you could explain by that model all the known phenomena of electromagnetic induction and electromagnetism as it was known at that time. See my book on the theory of the constant field, which one of my fans has actually brought along for me to sign. Okay, there's lots, lots more details uh, of what's going on in that book. But that could account for the known laws of electrom electromagnetism. And then Max realized that he could work out the speed at which disturbances would move through an insulator or through free space. Because what he assumed was that in this, you could identify these little spheres with electric particles. And so if you put an electric field on it, then you're going to have them moving, right? So that was his motivation for saying we had to take account of the tiny displacements of the idle wheels from their equilibrium positions. If you were in a conductor, then the little particles would just zoom through the, through the, through the vortices. If you were in, an, uh, in a, an insulator, then they couldn't escape, but they would be deflected by an electric field. So what that meant was he had to add in extra terms, and the current associated with the displacement of the idle wheels with JD, which he wrote this way, because it had to depend upon the strength of the changing electric field. And that's the origin of the displacement current, which was in many ways the great discovery which closed the field equations and enabled him to do great things. Well, to his amazement, when he went through the mathematics, he found that the speed of the disturbances was exactly the speed of light. That had been determined by Leon Foucault, but also he needed the values of electrostatic and electromagnetic constants, which appear in the expressions for the forces between particles and between magnets. And he took the ratio of these from the very accurate work of Weber and Kohlrausch, which had appeared in the previous years. So you've got a triple coincidence. You've got his expression for the speed of light, you've got the measured value of the constants of electricity and magnetism, and you've got uh, the actual measurement by Foucault. And they all agreed within 2%. Here's Maxwell's word. We can scarcely avoid the inference that light consists in the transverse modulations of the same medium, which is the cause of electric and magnetic phenomena. This is the unification of light and, electromag light and electromagnetic radiation. <laughs> now, this was all built on a model which had filled up the whole of space with rotating vortices and, bull and, and ball bearings and idle wheels and all this sorts of nonsense. People were not too happy because what's going on? You know, what is this model? Here's what he writes. I do not bring it forward as a mode of connection existing in nature. It is, however, a mode of connection which is mechanically conceivable and it serves to bring out the actual mechanical connections between known electromagnetic phenomena. And as I say, this discovery was the unification of light and electromagnetism. Now, it was not only, it was not only the continental uh, mathematicians who were very unhappy about this, but people were all these vortices and idle wheels and so forth. Now, this is where the great paper uh, that was written uh, again 150 years ago comes in. in. By 1864, Maxwell developed the whole theory on a much more abstract basis without any assumptions about the nature of the medium through which the electromagnetic phenomena are propagated. Out go all the vortices, out go the, uh, uh, the idle wheels, and all that is left are the fields themselves. And this, to quote Edmund Whittaker, in this, the architecture of his system was displayed, stripped of the scaffolding by aid of which it had been first erected. Now, oh, okay, now, if you don't like mathematics at this point, just have a little pause and think about poetry or something. But, but here is scientific poetry of the very highest order. Now, here's what happens in the, in the paper. Now, it turns out, if you go for all the gory details, uh, see my paper to be published on the 6th of March, 
in the Philosophical Transaction, I was invited to write a commentary on Maxwell's great paper to celebrate the 350th anniversary of the Foundation of Philosophical Transactions, which happens to coincide with the 150th anniversary of his creations. Anyway, so anyway, when you read the paper first, you say, well, you say, oh my god, what's going on? I can't, I can't read this stuff. So what I did was to produce this translation table from Maxwell's notation into something very close to modern notation. And you end up then with what are called 20 equations for 20 variables, right? This is the original version. But when you write it this way, every physicist in the room will say, I recognize all of this. It's looking like exactly modern notation nowadays. So uh, you can see we've got three equations for magnetic force written now in terms of A, the vector potential, what you call the electric momentum, uh, and that's number one. Three equations for the currents, three equations for the electromagnetic force, three equations for le le electric el elasticity, and that's very Im impressive because electric elasticity is just the displacement current. It's the displacement which happens on atoms of molecules or any material in the presence of the electric field. We've got three equations of uh, uh, electric elasticity, three equations of electric resistance. Now, that's a dodgy one, because the, the Ohm's law was an extremely dodgy thing, which was only proved to be absolutely right by Maxwell and his student in 1878. Up till then, it was not certain it was a good thing, largely because temperature effects would affect the linear relationship between the two. Three equations for the total turns, one equation for free electricity, one equation of continuity. And what people always say, oh, it's a terrible mess of set of equations. Actually, it boils down to almost exactly what we do today with, in the following way. So uh, let me just show you uh, what, what you do. Um, uh, here are the, the, the 20 quantities to be, uh, to be determined. But that's cheating, because they're just three components of one vector. right? So you get rid of lots of them uh, right away. And if you now then write them in the equivalence of modern forms using the curl and div, the vector, the vector operators, that's what you end up with. And you will notice, in particular, that if you take these four, these are Maxwell's equations. And they're exactly the form that we would write them today. There's one little wrinkle, which is that Maxwell worked with convergence rather than divergence. And so it's minus sign, which gets wrong. Like, other than that, it's at all absolutely great. So, uh, all, all I'm making the point is people tend to say that Maxwell's equations were cleaned up by Helmholtz and Hertz. They weren't, they were all. People just be lazy. It's all. <laughs> Maxwell did the whole goddamn thing in, the, in this one great paper. But note now what's happened. Everything is now written in terms of fields, <coughs> and no forces appear anywhere. Now, this is the great intellectual revolution that went on. One was going to replace the new mechanics of Newton with, the, with this field picture where the forces only appear after additional things that you put in the end. And that's the huge uh, revolution that, again, uh, to, took place. So uh, here, 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 this in the, in, in the final form that we write them, write them today. Uh, Maxwell's own view of this work, this is what Francis Everett called a rare moment of unveiled exuberance from Maxwell in a letter to Charles Key. I have also a paper afloat containing an electromagnetic theory of light, which, till I am convinced to the contrary, I call to be great guns. <laughs> that is Maxwell being excited. Which explains uh, why uh, I, I couldn't resist, resist calling my paper. Eight people, I hold to be great guns. And you, 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 you just couldn't miss that as a title of, title of the paper. Now, again, another... The, the paper, I, I've been living with this paper now for, for a month. And you're know, really deconstructing every sentence in it. And the depth of the sheer brilliance of, of what he's saying is much better than all the modern textbooks. You've, you've got to work hard on it, but it's there. But here's the key thing that really introduces the whole concept of modern physics, which is based upon fields. Here's what he writes immediately after he, 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 he had written the, uh, the, the equation. 
Now here, in speaking of the energy of the field, however, I wish it to be understood literally. All energy is the same as mechanical energy, whether it exists in the form of motion or in that of elasticity or in any other form. The energy in electromagnetic phenomena is mechanical energy. The only question is, where does it reside? On the old theories, it resides in electrified bodies, conducting circuits and magnets in the form of an unknown quantity called potential energy or the power of producing certain effects at a distance. It's an action at a distance theory. That's what the, 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 what happened before Maxwell. And then he goes on. On our theory, it resides in the electromagnetic field in the space surrounding the electrified and magnetic bodies as well as in those bodies themselves and is in two different forms which we describe without hypothesis as magnetic polarization and electric polarization or according to a very probable hypothesis as the motion and the strain of one and the same medium. Now the deep thing that has happened is that actually the distance has been thrown out and replaced by physics of fields. And then you only find our traditional force equations if you then take the field equations and then go through the correct operations to put it into force equations. This is absolutely utter genius. Now, the problem is that nobody, very few people actually go through it and work on the paper because it, it's, it's a 50 page paper of considerable effort to get through. But it is utterly intellectually absolutely fantastic. Well, uh, here, 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 here's the final slide. And uh, this is what Einstein uh, wrote about Maxwell. We may say that before Maxwell, physical reality, insofar as it was to represent the process of nature, was thought of as consisting of material particles whose variations consist only in movements governed by partial differential equations. Now, that is saying, what is that is saying? That is action at a distance. Since Maxwell's time, physical reality has been thought of as represented by continuous fields governed by partial differential equations and not capable of any mechanical interpretation. This change in the conception of reality is the most profound and the most fruitful that physics has experienced since the time of Newton. And as I was said, stated earlier, there's no way that Einstein could have done what he did without completely overturning the action of this and working entirely in terms of the properties of the fields. So this is just one tiny little example of, of, of Maxwell's supreme genius. For, for people like me, we've got Newton, and we've got Einstein, and we've got Maxwell, Scotland's greatest physicist and theoretical physicist by a long way. They're all on the same plane. Thank you very much. Uh, Malcolm, so you've just acknowledged the debt which Einstein owed to Maxwell, which I think you know many in the room would heartily endorse that viewpoint. Um, I'm going to ask what some might see as a slightly more um, speculative uh, question, which is, given that Maxwell died so young, do you think there's any indications in the work he had done up until his death that he may have been led towards something like special relativity before Einstein got there? Well, I think the answer is he got very, very close indeed. Now, we've seen this example of the full potential uh, using the A and phi, uh, that one example. Uh, I discovered, uh, I'm writing up our bits of the history just now, there's a posthumous paper in which he, he describes the Michelson Mori experiment. And in fact, it was by reading that that Michelson did the experiment. So Maxwell knew that he had to do that experiment to try to measure the motion of the ether. If he'd lived longer, then he would. Now, what happened in, 18, uh, in 1880 when that paper was published, Michelson did the first experiment, but it was too small and there were errors in the way. He actually got the wrong exp expression for the expression for the difference between the yeah. propagation in two directions. In the 1887 paper, uh, then they got the fantastic null result of the Michelson model experiment. And in the same year, Voigt used that fact to derive the Lorentz transformations simply on the basis that the speed of light was independent of the frame of reference. 
Now, if Vark could do it, maximum of even the time. There's no question. There's no question about that. More questions? Over here? Okay. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, yes, that was uh, very interesting. Um, in that, um, Maxwell seems to have uh, um, anticipated a lot of Einstein's thinking um, and, and possibly gave Einstein much of his um, inspiration. Um, if, I mean, is it conceivable that if he had thought um, more deeply about the nature of electricity and the discrete units uh, that uh, electrons are, uh, he might have come up with the particle theory of light, uh, the wave-particle duality of light, which later becomes very critical, doesn't it? Uh, yes, of course, the, 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 there's another story about the discovery of photons and so forth. Yeah. It doesn't really start until 1906, and even then it took a long time before people would accept that you know, the, the, the light was the light of radiation. Um, I, I, I've been talking a lot with, uh, with Isabel Faulkner about this, and she, she's convinced me that really Maxwell's thought was really mechanical. Oh. And every time he goes back, now in the great paper of 1865, I've just been absolved it for all of this time. What you'll find is that the way in which he writes down things like magnetic induction and self mutual induction, it's all based on mechanical model. He actually uses the mechanics of Lagrange and Laplace to be able to formulate the, form, the equations according to the classical dynamics. And the other point that uh, Isabel makes is that really the, the, the attempts by Kelvin and Maxwell to actually find out what atoms were, the only thing they had was the ether, and you had to find some classical physics could make atoms out of the ether. Right. Okay. You didn't have anything to determine the size of atoms according to classical physics. So there's a, there's a tangled story there, uh, which again I could bore you with in your end. I think the answer is until the great experiments uh, of the uh, of the photoelectric effect and Einstein's work on right. the statistical mechanics of radiation in the green region of the spectrum, you couldn't actually say that you had a particle picture for light. Okay. So it, it's. It, it was much too early. Uh, it was, it, I, I don't think there's any way that Maxwell could do Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Can I ask you one then, Mark? Sure. Very often you find there are several people working towards the same end, you know, and somebody gets there first. Who else was working on kind of field theory of electromagnetism? Anybody? Uh, well, there were lots and lots of people. And of course, the principal ones were, 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 were Helmholtz. Um, uh, also favor they were all working on this but they were adopting the action at a distance point of view rather than the field picture so yes. you, you, I think you have to draw rather carefully this distinction the field theory didn't exist until Maxwell actually showed that you had to work backwards from the fields to get the mechanical the, the mechanical effects uh, now part of the problem about Maxwell he was just too modest right he was a very very nice very modest child and the story, which is amazing, he was president of the physics section of the, uh, of the uh, British Association for the Advancement of Science, and he had to review the whole of electromagnetism. And he reviewed everybody else's theories, except his own. And he said, uh, there's another theory, which I prefer. He didn't say it was his own, or describe anything about what the content of it was. And as, uh, as, uh, as Stephen Dyson said, more of this is that modesty is not always a virtue. <laughs> and is he talking to other people at all during this time? I mean, exchanging ideas, or did he really just do all this on his own? Um, he did all of this on his own. That people like Kelvin, William Thompson, uh, uh, who he, he did not believe the displacement current. He said it's a completely artificial thing to put into the equation. There's no evidence for it. Now, that's coming from Kelvin, who was no slouch, yeah. uh, theoretically. Likewise, Helmholtz had his own two uh, by field uh, uh, theory as well. The key thing that really converted everyone was in the 1887 experiments uh, by, by Hertz, yeah. where it was demonstrated that the waves <coughs> did propagate exactly according to the laws of rectilinear propagation, diffraction, and all of these sorts of things.
Any other questions? Yes, one over here. Is it true that Faraday tried to take the wave as Hertz did, but ran into the next room to see an effect, thus missing any possible Sorry, effect? Is it true that Faraday did try to do what Hertz did, which was create a wave and then receive it, but did so by running into the next room to see if he could observe it, i.e. missing it by several give, seconds? I can't give you a different answer on that, but it's certain that Maxwell did try to detect the electromagnetic waves when it was back in Cambridge. But the equipment they had was nowhere near sensitive to that. Nothing. Yes, one over here. The actual Hertz experiments are rather amazing. I, 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 the original is still in Bonn, and you can see it there. It's a gigantic piece of apparatus, two big spheres, where you produce a great big spark between them, and then you detect the signal by producing sparks further away between two tiny little things. And that way he was able to get the interference of, of, of the waves. Now, if that wasn't exactly what, it, that's the sort of thing you have to try to do to, to make it. I, I must check up whether, in fact, you, your story is... It seems apocryphal, but <coughs> so poetic. It's, 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 a, it's a tough experiment. And <coughs> you, know, you, you have to look very closely to the tiny little sparks of the little spheres. <coughs> Did Aberdeen ever regret the fact that they had not had it? Well, um, John Reed has written up a beautiful He's written beautiful stuff about Maxwell and I mean, yeah, the, the, the two universities were amalgamated into one. One senior professor had been there 20 years and ran the university and everything else. And Maxwell had been there for four years. Was uh, you know he, he was he was a junior person. And you know it, it's it would happen in your university too. It would happen in mine. Yes. Yeah. It happened again. That would be later. <laughs> <laughs> One last question from anyone? No? Well, thank you very much, Malcolm. Pleasure. Sir? That's a great story. That's a great story.